All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, as usual. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and we're continuing. We're going to continue our study of the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra, Bodhisattva Inexhaustible Intellect. Um, you may have noticed right away that it's our same whiteboard tonight. And that's because I had a few requests to go a little further on these 10 samadhis. I know last week I kind of, I introduced them kind of quickly. I felt, um, in a way I felt a little obliged to do what I did last week, which was, you know, we had been, we had been studying or reading or looking at the sutra for, for a, a, quite a while, <laughs> you know, a good, a good like 25 <laughs> sessions. And so last week, um, I took the time to go back to the beginning to sort of read the sutra from the beginning so that we would remind ourselves of like, wait, where are, what's going on here? Um, so I did that for a few reasons. Um, the main reason I think that I did that last week was that these samadhis that we're gonna talk about in depth tonight, these samadhis are, are achieved or attained or reached. The language here is tricky. But these samadhis are attained, I'll use the classic language of attainments, so they are attained upon this initial generation of the idea of, of enlightenment. In particular, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the supreme unsurpassable enlightenment of a Buddha. And this sutra, of course, is sort of um, it's not unique, actually. It's pretty much right in line with some pretty standard teachings regarding the Bodhisattva path, but it's an interesting presentation of this where at the beginning of the sutra, the Buddha discusses these 10 initiations of enlightenment. And of course, this idea of initiate means to begin, to start, to like head off. And so it's kind of a little odd <laughs> for there to be 10 initiations. Like you, you kind of just started up once, but it, it's a little trickier than that. And so there are, this sutra is based on this idea of generating or initiating this determination for supreme enlightenment. And then sort of, generating this determination as it pertains to 10 paramitas and 10 stages. So everything in this sutra is happening in tens. We, we know that already. And these 10 samadhis, well, each one is attained upon each of those 10 initiations for the the attainment of enlightenment in that way. I'm probably already confusing this more than it needs to be because I'm trying to clarify things. My point is I went all the way back to the beginning to remind us of these 10 initiations and how they relate to the 10 stages and how those relate to the 10 paramitas. And I kind of wanted to reacquaint us with all of the different aspects of this sutra um, and, and mainly so that we could really appreciate these samadhis. Um, and I guess what, again, what I'm trying to say is that these samadhis are not the result of paramita cultivation. They're not the result of the stages. They're the results of these initiations or these generations for enlightenment. And since those 10 initiations or generations of enlightenment were mentioned all the way back at the beginning of the sutra, I felt obliged to kind of remind ourselves and reacquaint ourselves with all of that. Also some of the various bodhisattva players that are, they're gonna pop up again in a little bit. So I wanted to kind of bring them back up in, into the conversation. But anyways, again, I digress. 
I went through all of that to, you know, again, to sort of contextualize what's happening here. Cause I recognize we've gotten, you know, we've been in this for so long, it starts to get a little confusing in that way, even to me in that sense. And so I wanted to do that. And then last week, because I did a kind of a, a clean reading of the beginning of the sutra, and I kind of got into uh, answering questions about samadhis, I pretty much really rushed through all 10 of these. And it was my intention not to do the thing that I have been doing, which is spend one night on each samadhi. I didn't want to do that. So I'm not making any promises that this will be the last night that we discuss samadhis, but who knows? Um, anyways, welcome to the Dharma Doors. <laughs> I'm MC Owens. <laughs> um, tonight's samadhi night. We are only talking about samadhi. Um, I've been doing deep, deep dives into samadhis. Um, I've had questions myself. Um, and so, yeah, tonight we're going to do a deep dive into samadhis, proper, like real proper um, uh, dissection of this idea. And I do plan on going through these a little more carefully and kind of putting them in their proper context of the sutra. So, but before we discuss these particular samadhis, let's get clear about what a samadhi is. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't, I don't, I don't know. And I say, I say that jokingly, but honestly, uh, so here's our sources tonight. I have four interesting sources. Uh, uh, these are in addition to our sutra, by the way. So the first text, I read this, I've read this pfft, so many, I read this like once a week practically, because there's a lot of good information in here. So I present this to you as a scholarly academic study of the idea of samadhi. And the reason why a text like this by Stuart Ray Sarbacker, Stuart Ray Sarbacker, and the book is just called Samadhi. <laughs> this is a great book if you would like to know more about the idea of samadhi. You maybe you want to read about some practices. This is, again is not a practitioner's book. This is an academic book, but it is the best academic book I have found on the subject. Samadhis are, of course, a very tricky subject. If you go talking to some Zen people, they're going to tell you what a samadhi is, but they're going to give you that Zen version of samadhi. You go talking to some Tibetan Vajrayana. Uh, tantrists, they'll tell you about samadhi, but they're going to tell you about that kind of, their kind of samadhi. And indeed, in the world of Buddhism, if you go to these different um, schools or different churches or whatever you want to call them, you can find out about samadhi, but it's usually going to be that type of Buddhism's idea of samadhi. And so this is actually a great book for kind of basically being non-sectarian in that way. Uh, Stuart Ray Sarbacker doesn't seem to have a, a pony in this, in this race in that way, really just trying to get at the history of this term. So this is highly recommended. The second book that I was reading is I always go back to Edward Konza. So Edward Konza is like an old school Buddhist studies person, translated all the Pranyaparamita sutras. Um, he's like a really, back in the day in the 50s and 60s, Edward Konza was like the, the premier Buddhologist and Buddhist scholar. Um, he wrote a book called Buddhist Meditation. Sorry, it's not, there it is, Buddhist Meditation by Edward Konza. It's a little outdated, but it is still actually quite a good study of it. Edward Konza, also an academic, so he's actually doing the thing that I do, which is he's going to tell you what, um, well, this isn't just about samadhi, of course, so it's about the whole practice of meditation, 
but he's going to do the thing that I do, which is he talks about the early kind of Theravada type. He talks about Mahayana. He talks about some differences. Um, and he's a really good scholar. So he has a lot of good information regarding the use of the term Samadhi. So these are two interesting academic studies. This one's very modern from the 2000s. Again, this one's sort of a little more dated. The third source of information, and I'm doing this all right now because I'm probably gonna jump around a lot. The third source of information, this one, I debated about whether to even tell you about this one, but I know you can handle this. And because I, I know this is a lot of information already, but I know that's what you, you come to me for the information. So I just got this a few days ago. I've read it several times since I got it. It's my new favorite. Uh, it's called a sutra. So I'll say it's my new favorite sutra. So this is a sutra called the Sutra uh, on the Concentration of Sitting Meditation. And the word that's being uh, translated as concentration is our samadhi. So that's going to be our first definition or translation of samadhi tonight is concentration. What's interesting about this, this amazing sutra, is that it's actually not a sutra. Uh, it's certainly in, in, it's a text that was written in Chinese. And insofar as it's a Chinese text, it is most certainly a, a jing. A jing is this word for a classic, a, uh, a scripture. Indeed, all sutras are called jing, but you may also know the Tao Te Ching, and that's a Taoist classic, the Tao Te Ching or jing. So what I'm saying is, is the word sutra in Chinese, it just means a classic, not necessarily a sutra, a Buddha sutra in that way. And so they call this the sutra on the concentration of seated meditation. But it was written by a Central Asian monk named Kumara Jiva. Kumara Jiva is a uh, very important personage in the history of Buddhism. He is, again, he's from Kucha, which was, is, I guess, was in Central Asia, uh, kind of near Kashmir, sort of. He eventually goes to China. He, Kumara Jiva, knows many, many, many languages. By the way, this is around 300 AD, give or take, a decade or two. Around 300, Kumara Jiva, who is this, uh, by all accounts, he's a Buddhist savant, speaks all the languages. Not only like, does he know all these sutras, he's, he's a, he knows them all, like from memory. And so he goes to China and he starts translating uh, the Lotus Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Malakirti Sutra, uh, you name it. Uh, it's all coming out of Kumara Jiva in that way. And eventually, I think it was his students, if, I, if I'm reading this correctly, I think it was, it was for his students. This is Kumara Jiva. They were asking him, but what's up with like, you know, the, the sitting down thing, you know, meditation. And so he wrote a meditation book for his students. <laughs> and this is the, one of the most valuable pieces of information I have found lately. It ties together, I actually wish I would have found this a uh, month, two or, or three ago, because he talks about uh, something like the 32 characteristics of the Buddha. But he talks about them in terms of a meditation and it's really, really, really interesting. Um, I could actually just, and I do plan to eventually do a class just on this. It's so interesting. Um, but my point, the reason why I bring this up is, is that he talks about samadhi. In fact, it's called the Sutra on the Samadhi of Seated Meditation. And so to read this is very helpful for coming to an understanding of samadhi 
at least according to Komara Jiva in the fourth century in China. The fourth piece of information is from the Buddha himself. So from the Samyutta Nikaya, from the connected discourses of the Buddha, I'm gonna go way deep. I'm going deep into the, uh, I guess this would be Sutra number 45 of the Samyutta Nikaya. And it's the eighth section of the 45th Sutra. I know this gets crazy. There's so many sutras. This is a tiny little sutra. Um, geez, it's only like, it's a page and a half. It's a page and a half. And it is a, a sutra, a teaching that the Buddha gave at Shravasti. In, and it's called an analysis of the Eightfold Path. And that is exactly what it is. And it, and again, it's one of, uh, it's another sutra that I hadn't really read or hadn't really come across until recently. I think, yeah, even before we get into all of this, even before we get into these samadhis, I think this is the place to start, don't you? Like the, the old school, right? Um, Oh, it is tempting to start here. I'm going to hold off on a second, actually, on that. So here's the deal. You kind of have four or five interesting terms in Buddhism that all pertain to what we would call meditation. So I say this a lot, that we have this one word in English, meditation. And it pertains to, you know, I don't know, take your pick. I don't even know exactly what that word meditation in English is, you know. Um, but we have that one word, whereas in the Buddhist tradition, you're working with, well, you're working with one idea of shamatha, which means calming down or just calmness in a way, shamatha. Shamatha. There is a word I don't use a lot. Um, it pops up every now and then. It's a, it's a it's a term called bhavana, b h a v a n a, bhavana. If you know bhava, essence in a be, being in a sense, bhava means being, in a in a sense. Bhavana is sort of beingness. Sort of, it, it, etymologically, it's kind of what it means, but it actually has a certain connotation of like working on being, the work of being or something like that. I'll, I'll tell you though, as I've seen bhavana used, bhavana is this, it's sometimes even translated as the work, meaning like the work of which shamatha, samadhi, and all of that are gonna be components of the work. So what I'm saying is, is that the term bhavana is used as a, the broadest of terms for all of this. So it, it could be in many ways, the umbrella term for all of this. So you got bhavana as the umbrella term, shamatha as this, this idea of calming, and then we have three more. <laughs> Sati, or in Sanskrit, Shmurti, which is usually translated as mindfulness. And like modern mindfulness, the whole mindfulness movement, that's all talking about this idea of Sati or Shmurti. And then we have two more. Dhyana, or jhana in the Pali, but dhyana in the Sanskrit, and finally samadhi. Uh, concentration is the normal translation of samadhi, concentration. Dhyana, I don't know, it, it has many standard translations actually. I don't think it actually has a standard translation. Trance, is a translation of dhyana that I have seen. 
absorption is an older translation of dhyana. Um, again, we're, we, we lack words for these things in English. And so I'm probably not going to talk about bhavana anymore. Again, it's kind of the general umbrella term that doesn't actually seem to apply to any specific activity. It applies to doing all of this, sati, dhyana, samadhi, uh, pra even pranayama, I have seen lumped in this category of the work or bhavana. So I'm not going to mention bhavana much anymore. Which And then, you know, shamatha, you know, shamatha is going to be important for tonight's talk because, you know, shamatha is the calming aspect of Buddhist practice and the pashina is the insight. So you have this idea of one aspect of the practice is about calming down. And then the other aspect of the practice is, is insight. And there's a way that samadhi is, at least according to some people, samadhi is when you're dealing with both shamatha and vipassana at the same time, both calming and insight. But not everybody agrees with that. And that's going to actually, yeah, tonight's going to be a bunch of me backing, like backing up and being like, but, except, however, and it's just, it's just really tricky. Even I actually, before I was getting ready for tonight's talk, I thought I had a pretty good hold on how these terms were used. I, it's like, it's one of those things. It's almost like the word meditation in English where we can keep, we can say it. And it's almost like, you know, if somebody was like, what did you do last night? And you're like, oh, meditated. There's a way that you would be like, hmm, yeah. And as if you knew what the person did, like, and so what I'm getting at is, is that there's a way that these words samadhi in particular, they just seem to be used a few different ways. And, and let's all be good Buddhists tonight in that way where we don't get dogmatic and say, oh no, but you know, Lama so-and-so says it, it, it samadhi is this. I know, <laughs> I get it. People say things definitively. I often say things definitively. But my, my point is, is that I'm here tonight to complicate this, not clarify it in that sense. Hey, Michael, I have a question. Hi. Yeah, let's start. Okay, um, question. Um, all these terms that you just threw around more or less, and they yep. seem like very similar, but also different. I'm wondering if the the goal of all these practices, the destination, are they all the same, which are, you know, enlightenment, cutting through illusion, understanding the ultimate um, um, uh, nature of reality? Because when I think concentration could have many different goals, why practicing concentration or mindfulness or um, some... Um, um, Vipassana. So I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about the, the goals, so to speak? Yes. I am going to be very explicit about the goal for, for once. <laughs> um, there's going to be subtle differences in a lot of this, but I will tell you that when we're talking about samadhi, dhyana, shamatha, those and, and mindfulness sati when we're talking about all of those i think it's very safe <laughs> to say that there, yeah I, i'm feeling good about this there is definitely one um common factor common element and it, it, it almost could be the goal connie almost and simply put it is about kama k-a-m-m-a -M -M -A, sensual desire i'm trying to just say this simply so you know i understand there's more to it than this but if you wanted to just put it simply uh, the normal mode of being is one of wantiness 
for stimulation. We are addicted to stimulation. We want to look at things, hear things, smell things, taste things, touch things. And us humans, we definitely want to think about something. We want, we want a puzzle. We want some gossip. We want thing, we love things to think about. That is all comma, K-A-M-M-A. That's all sensual wanting. I want to I want to see, I want to watch a show, I want to listen to a podcast, I want to eat something, I want to smell something. I want somebody to touch me and again most of all I want to be thinking about things. I'm I'm very uh satisfied when I'm thinking. I get bored. I get bored when I can't see something or hear something and especially when I'm just not you know, I don't have anything good to think about. So all of this Samadhi, dhyana, sati, shamatha, it's actually all about not doing that. And what I mean by that is, is the wantiness, the neediness, the sense of incompleteness without something. And so what we are talking about is a disturbed, distracted mind that is constantly seeking sensual satisfaction. And when I say sensual satisfaction, I do not mean sexuality. That's of course one sensual satisfaction. But when I say sensual satisfaction, I mean of all six senses, the mind included, and there's this way in which, again, we are kind of, from a Buddhist point of view, addicted to sensory stimuli. And so the, the work, the bhavana, the work is to not do that wantiness, to learn to control it. And in fact, Connie, if I could just go all the way to like the goal, I say this, I say this often. In my understanding, an aspect of the goal, not the whole thing, but a very important aspect of the teaching, the Dharma, Buddhism. It's that we humans, and in fact, of course, the Dharma applies to all sentient beings. If you have sensual organs, if you have sensory organs, they will want to be stimulated. And so all sentient beings suffer from this craving for sensual stimulation. We humans have it really bad because not only do we want this stuff, but we have wild imaginations and senses of self that can heap on top of the, the wanting things like guilt and shame and all kinds of other fun stuff on top of it. So we have our work cut out for us in that regard. But the, my understanding of the practice is this, we're convinced that, um, well, definitely joy and happiness. We're convinced that joy and happiness are right around the corner. <laughs> All I need is that. All I need is that one, whatever it is, and I will then be complete and happy and satisfied. And so that's what actually what we're in the business of doing is actually seeking this satisfaction. And I've said it a few times, we're also seeking a sense of fulfillment, by which I mean a sense that right now something's lacking. And so if only I had X, Y, or Z, I would no longer feel that lacking. That mentality that says I'm not complete and happy now, but I could be if X, Y, or Z. That mentality that seeks kama, that seeks sensual desire in order to create joy, satisfaction, and sense of completeness, the wisdom, the insight, the vipassana, 
is the realization that that is a never ending process. It actually, you don't ever get that one ice cream cone where you're like, that was it. I don't need to eat ice cream anymore. I attained it. It doesn't happen. You, we get satisfied for a brief moment and then we're on to the next in that way. And so what the teaching is, what the Dharma is, what the practice is, is realizing that there is a much, much higher, greater satisfaction that comes from not needing anything. There is a joy and a satisfaction and a sense of completeness that comes from being independent of everything in this world, not needing it not craving it in that way. And that's the practice, that's the work, is the default mode of gimme, 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 want, 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 and then doing a, a process in which one gets more and more comfortable with just being, and then gets more and more comfortable with just being, until finally one is actually totally liberated. And what we mean by liberation is liberated from needing or wanting anything in this world. And let me be very clear. This is about the emotional craving and needing. So the disposition, it's not about that you, yes, we must eat. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and so we eat. <laughs> yes, that's not gimme, gimme, gimme. So the problem here is the more wanty, clingy, needy, 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 not necessarily the activity of watching something listening to something, smelling something, eating something, feeling something, or even thinking about something. None of those are wrong or bad. It's the wanting, which that which you don't have. That's the problematic part. So can you, Marty, could you say like the problematic part comes down in when attachment arises? Oh, uh, well, you know, the Buddha taught this very intimate relationship between craving and attachment, which is that we are actually, we don't get attached to that which we don't crave. And so, yes, attachment is a problem. But the root cause of that problem is the tanha, the thirst the craving, the wanting, Buddha, the Buddha has taught. You deal with that, you don't have to worry about the attachment. So, um, and by the way, Connie, I didn't fully answer your question in, in, in its entirety because I didn't really mention the difference between samadhi, dhyana, and sati. I'm gonna keep using probably sati, but that's the Pali, Sanskrit is Shmurti. Mindfulness, dhyana, absorption, trance, I'm not sure, and then samadhi. Those are the three uh, terms. Those are the three terms I think that we need to deal with now. So I don't think there's actually much, uh, yeah, there's not much, uh, disagreement or any, a much problem with the idea of sati, shmirti, mindfulness. Again, that, that, yeah, that's a pretty like understood in terms of what it means. Mindfulness, you know, I love doing the thing where I'm like, if I never understand what a Buddhist term means, like mindfulness, I just try to think of the opposite of it. And mindlessness 
and like kind of being totally distracted and being all over the place. I'm very well acquainted with that. I, I, I got that. And so then I'm just like, oh, you mean it's the opposite of that? Huh, <laughs> okay. So that would be focused, together, not easily distracted, not, um, well, the main thing actually that I often teach is, is that an aspect of mindlessness, so if sati is mindfulness, then mindlessness, the way that I kind of teach it is, is sort of normally we have a lot on our mind. <laughs> we have, I, for example, have the earlier today, very much on my mind. Ideas from earlier today, events from earlier today, it's all very right here. I have ideas of later on tonight on my mind, after class, da-da-da. So I'm part of me sort of in the past, in some imagination, holding on to the past. It's part of my consciousness, my mindlessness is in the future, fantasizing and all of that. And then even the degree to which I'm, I'm with you, I'm here, <laughs> I'm teaching a class, right? So to the degree to which I'm here, I'm also aware of like things outside my window right here. I'm, a, I'm aware of my kind of immediate environment. And so my whole attention is not right here. Meaning it's present, but not here. It's sort of other places as well. And so if you add up the aspects of my mind that are in the past, the aspects of my mind that are in the future, the aspects of my mind that are not currently present with you right here, but in some other room in a way, worrying about what's going on in that room over there. The idea is, is like, I would only kind of be giving you maybe, you know, 40, 50% of my attention in that way because I have all this other stuff on my mind. Mindfulness is bringing it in. <laughs> and, you know, I think maybe we all have different ways of doing this if, if we are experienced meditators. But for me personally, it does begin with past and future, like kind of really letting those go in a way. Like if I'm gonna to try to be mindful, Sati, Shmurti, I'm going to practice mindfulness. For me, it's very much about jettisoning that which is not actually right in front of me. So that's kind of a very much, and again, this is no, I don't think many meditation teachers would disagree with me on this point that Sati or mindfulness is about bringing one's attention to what is right in front of you. Again, versus that which is fantasy or even that which is not right in front of you. It's your neighbors across the street or whatever. Fine, let them do whatever they're going to do. And the idea is, is that mindfulness is about this gathering of attention. And this is usually done, sati or mindfulness is usually done with an object. It could be a kashina, one of these kind of discs, an elemental disc, uh, which could take the shape. Kashinas are cool. They can either be actual, like a bowl of water, a fire pit, like so actual elemental, or it could be a red disc symbolizing the fire element, a black or dark blue disc symbolizing the water element and so on or it could be a candle flame, image of the Buddha, or like our friend Kumar Jiva suggests, breathing or sitting, but his main thing is breathing. Sorry, I didn't mention that. His main thing is a breathing technique. So the breath, whatever it is, one uses that object of focus, a kashina, candle flame, Buddha, or the breath or whatever, but you use that as an anchor for your attention in order to harness it so that it does not get into the past, future, or wanders into the neighbor next door neighbor's house. Stays right there. 
And of course, the mind has a tendency to wander. It's what it, it's what we've just, it was my answer to Connie, was that we are divided, we are all over the place. And so the whole point of this is to bring it together. And the very wise, beautiful, compassionate teaching of the Buddha is that when one mind, when one's mind wanders, you just bring it back. It's like, there's no, it's not punitive. It's, there's no problem. It's just, you bring it back. If you were counting, like if you're counting your breaths, you just start counting again. And the idea is, is that there is a very deep, I would almost say respect, but it's a very deep understanding that this is not the default human mode. <laughs> and so it's understandable that our minds will wander, but the technique as simple as it seems, the technique is when you realize that you are no longer focused on the object, you just bring it back. <laughs> and the more you do this, the better you get at sati, the better you get at mindful awareness to the point where when you decide, you know what, I want to meditate, you can even, you don't even need a kashina or anything at a certain point you can just bring your attention to a fixed focused point. And as loud as the neighbors get or whatever, you can stay with that object and you are not distractible. In the Tibetan tradition, they call this mind training. And that's a great term because it's exactly what it is. We are training our minds. We are disciplining our own minds that would like to be all like, no, 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 I wanna go eat something. No, 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 I need to watch something. And you're in charge, so you're saying, hold on, I'm gonna meditate. <laughs> and so we are, uh, we are up against ourselves in a sense or an aspect of ourselves. And so again, the teaching is, of sati is very simple. You just come, keep coming back until it gets, I don't want to say easier because I don't want to make it sound like it's about that, but it's about how we are, I guess the right term would be habituated actually. We're actually habituated into seeking sensual pleasure. We don't actually know any better way. And for the most part, our parents taught us that's, that's what you do. You seek sensual satisfaction in this world. We, we're often either, you know, rewarded for doing it or all of these things. So it is a habituated mode of behavior. And so you can look at Buddhist practice as a form of like rehabituation in a sense of like developing different habits. So rather than the habit of distractibility, you develop the habit of focus where that's just like the default mode that you just slip into focus all the time. And it, it, that doesn't happen without practice and training in that way. And so the premier, and by premier, I mean the first, the first practice is sati, mindfulness. Sati or mindfulness, that kind of focus brings about shamatha. It brings about a calm state. All right, before we talk about dhyana and samadhi, any questions uh, so far? Cool. Michael, I oh, no, yeah, yeah no. Um, I, this, this has been helpful and, and clarifying in the sense that I see why I'm always so confused. <laughs> 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 and I still am uh, about some of these terms, but in particular, I don't see where in this scheme Vipassana fits in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can, I can make up where it fits in, but, you know, and again, I know that different teachers use it in different ways and, but where would you fit it in this scheme? Um, the only place I was going to fit it was when we got to Samadhi and I was going to talk about the 
insight or vipassana aspect to samadhi that that may be a part of it according to some teachers otherwise otherwise no the reason why i'm not mentioning it is for the most part when we're talking certainly when we're talking about shamatha mindfulness and dhyana <laughs> Again, samadhi, and I do want to get to samadhi tonight, but those three ideas, calming down, using mindful, focused awareness, sati, and then coming to a dhyana, which we haven't talked about yet tonight, but we will. All of that, and this kind of goes back actually to my answer to Connie, all of that is about trying, and I, even trying is wrong. All of that is about not doing anything, not even thinking. Once one has really, really established mindfulness, there's very little karmic activity of the body, the mouth, and the mind. There's very little movement. And in fact, all of this is actually going towards a still state with no thinking, no speaking, and no bodily activity. Total stillness. Having arrived at such states can allow for insights to arise, they can allow for a deeper understanding of the Dharma because the mind's been cleared. But in terms of shamatha, sati, and dhyana, it's actually a slow progress towards coming to stillness. And the thing about it is, is I realize, and I, I joke about this often, I realize that to the discursive mind, when the, the mind, when the discursive thinking mind hears no movement, no speaking, and no thinking, it says, well, that sounds like death, so I'm not going to go anywhere near that, thanks. That does not sound like a good time. It doesn't sound like anything I want to be involved with, because I want to keep thinking away. So come on, Buddha, there must be something else where there's some sort of, maybe give me a visualization, or maybe, a, you know, give me something to think about. Because I know, Buddha, you're not going to leave me just there not thinking. And I actually think a lot, a lot of meditation techniques come from a fear people have of just sitting silently still. And so, no, give me something to imagine because then I won't be so bored or I won't actually be so afraid of stillness in a way. And so, as far as I can tell, this road... <laughs> has no vipassana in that way as far as you are actually trying to not think about anything for a moment. I have more to say about vipassana, but in terms of what we're talking about right now, and again, Connie's great question, that real blunt question of like, what's the goal here? I think the goal is stillness, and that's defined again by no mental activity. So, so, yeah, no. Just again, going back to, you started this all out by saying, we in English have one word meditation. And in the Buddhist tradition, there are at least five different words that may encompass that, right? You would not include Vipassana in that. Or, or you will oh, when you get later. I, I, I'll answer that now okay. because I don't know if I'll get to it later. So on that note, and, and thanks, Noam, because I know that everybody knows about the Shamatha Vipassana. And so I should say something about it. Um, so this Vipassana, right? That, yeah, it's one part of the teaching. It's one aspect of it. Um, you can translate Vipassana as seeing clearly, as clear sight. Um, it kind of means like supervision or insight in a deep way. I'm the type of, um, and, and I actually, I recognize that this makes me 
a little unique or, or just different in that way. I don't teach Vipassana like a lot of people teach Vipassana. I don't teach it as a practice. I, I, I believe in insights, in the realization of these insights, but I actually think it's, um, and this kind of betrays or it reveals that I'm much more of a Mahayana Buddhist in this way, which is that I think all Buddhist insights, whether it's the about uh, the three poisons or five aggregates, four noble truths, five skandhas, uh, all of these insights, I believe we all already know. But due to the cloudy confusion of kama, of wanting, we are, we don't see clearly. We, these are things we know, but we don't act on them properly, or we forget that these things are true. And so doing the shamatha and clearing the mind of all the gunk, I believe allows for these insights to arise. Now, I'm also, you know, really into uh, study, like both as a student and as a teacher and all of that. And so I believe, I believe very much in cramming our heads full of enough Dharma, like that we learn all of this, but not like as a practice necessarily, but so that we are familiar with the terms and the ideas so that when we have that that insight arise in us regarding the tricky nature of the self, even maybe the illusory non-existent nature of the self. We again already know this in a way. And I think when that insight arises, if we have already been introduced to the, to the Buddhist idea of anatta or anatman, there's a way that we can put that together faster in a sense or more clearly. But I don't actually teach any practices for Vipassana besides study. Like study is for me the practice in that sense. And then the other side of the practice is calm, quiet meditation to rest, to, to rest basically, to give the mind a much needed rest. So just to reiterate in the way you teach and some one way of looking at it is that in the meditation is strictly the samad, the shamatha, the the calming down. It does not include the vipassana part, and and clearly a lot of people do do meditation that they consider vipassana or that. Got and they meditate in a vipash vipassanic way, <laughs> and I get that. And 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 you know, it's not that. I, you know, it's tricky. I just think it's something else. Uh -huh. And what I mean by that is, is that for me, a big part of Vipassana is, you know, it is, it is what people would call analysis in the sense of Vipassana is about peeling back the layers of our own mind, right? And so if we find ourselves getting angry we can do some Vipassana work, which is we can dig into that and kind of ask ourselves, but like, but what's really going on here? And it's like, oh, my ego is being threatened. Somebody's threatening my ego. Somebody doesn't think I'm whatever enough. So I'm angry. And so you can kind of do this kind of analysis. And I do think that's a really big part of what clearly seeing is. I just think that there's a way that that type of activity can be very stimulating. <laughs> and so to call it meditation for me is a little misleading because I think meditation is all about just calming down. Mm -hmm. So again, um, so let's, we're gonna move towards Samadhi, a clearer definition of it. I'm gonna start by actually telling you not if this isn't the wrong definition it's the definition that i would give a lot i always give this definition of it and it's not wrong i can i can produce the sources <laughs> for you to to prove that it's just the way it's taught so the way that i teach the process is that sati 
focused awareness, sati. Cre uh, creates the conditions for calm. And if one really jettisons the past and the future and fantasy and really can be presently aware, which means not about my neighbors and what's going on next door, but just here, the way that I would normally teach this and the way that it is normally taught is that then through that process, if one becomes entirely present, one can slip into what is called a dhyana or a jhana. And there are four stages of absorption, trance. Again, this word dhyana definitely doesn't have a translation. Um, but it is, well, yeah, yeah, it's again, I wanna finish my original way of teaching this because then I'm gonna complicate it. I would normally teach this that mindful awareness, sati, when it has all been brought into the presence, one enters a dhyana or a jhanic state. There are four stages of that. And when one passes out of the fourth deepest jhana, one enters a samadhi. And there are four successive stages of samadhi until a point of that stillness that we are talking about. The actual stilling of all karmic production. And if you are familiar with the five skandhas, the five aggregates of the self, if you're familiar with those, then you know about samskara, mental conditioning. But it's not just mental conditioning because there's bodily samskara, bodily habits, which actually include the in, uh, inhalation and exhalation of the lungs. This is actually a kaya samskara, a body conditioning to, to breathe. So there's bodily samskara, there is vach samskara, there is vocal samskara, conditioned habits of speech, and then there is also mental habits. And again, if you're familiar with the five skandhas, you will know that a large degree of our thinking is actually habitual samskaric conditioned thinking. Not off the dome piece, just freestyle thinking whatever I want all the time, but actually totally conditioned thought forms. What they say is, is that the deeper samadhis, actually the reason why you need those stages or those periods of stillness and rest where the mind is not turning and thinking, it's actually so that you don't produce any new samskara, any new habituation. And if you think of your mind as if you think of your samskara, the habits of the mind, as these uh, mountains and valleys of consciousness, those still states of samadhi iron out samskara. They actually allow the mind to stop being habituated and to come to a more, you know, what they would call tabla rasa, a clean slate where you haven't been, I mean, you've been conditioned, but now those conditionings have been ironed out. And so the idea is that when you come out of that deep, deep samadhi of nothingness, you are seeing the world sort of anew, totally fresh in a way. And the only way you get to have those clear eyes that aren't judging things based on past experience is if you've ironed out your samskara in that way. So that's the traditional way of teaching these, that there's these four dhyanas and four samadhis. Again, there are sources for this. This is kind of almost like mainline Buddhism, like this, that's just what it is. 
But now let's hear from the Buddha. Let's hear from the man himself, right? So I already told you this is the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha. If you don't know about the Samyutta Nikaya, um, as, a, as a scholar and a historian, I can tell you, and this isn't just you know, my opinion, there's many scholar and historians opinions, that the Samyutta Nikaya contains the earliest teachings. Like actually even the very, very first teaching of the Buddha, the Turning the Dharma Wheel Sutra is way back here at the end of this. This is, um, if, if I were going to ever write a PhD dissertation about this, these, the sutras in this collection, they seem like the earlier versions of everything. And if you go and grab your, especially your Diga Nikaya, your long discourses of the Buddha, these seem to be the same teachings in their most fully formed version, like the longest, most elaborate. And what's interesting is that if you con contrast teachings from the long discourses to some of these older ones in here, it definitely looks like things changed a little bit over time as the system became systematized, as it became a process in that way. So I'm not gonna to read to you this whole thing. It's very short though, I could, but it just says, bhikkhus, monks, I will teach you the Noble Eightfold Path and I will analyze it for you. So that's exciting, right? So listen, listen attentively and I will speak. So, you know, if you're familiar with the Eightfold Path, this is actually a really good sutra. It's a very straightforward, um, you know, what is right view? Knowing the Four Noble Truths. There's no other option in the sutra. That is what right view means. Understanding the Four Noble Truths, right? Uh, and then, so what I mean is, is and I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you're looking for the simplest, most direct answer for what is right intention, what's right speech, what's right livelihood, this is the sutra to go to for the kind of the oldest, simplest answer. And so if you're familiar with the Noble Eightfold Path, which I hope you are, the final two steps on the path are right sati, right mindfulness, and the last step on the Eightfold Path is right concentration or right samadhi. So right sati, right mindfulness is the four foundations of mindfulness, the satipatthana. So the body, sensations of the body, mind states and dharmas, kaya, vedana, chitta, dharma. So those are the four foundations of mindfulness. The, this is of course the teaching on sati. It's the satipatthana, the foundations of mindfulness, and by the way, all the steps on the Noble Eightfold Path, of course, are spoken about in terms of right, right speech, right action, right mindfulness. And what this implies is that there's a wrong way to do it. <laughs> there's a right way and a wrong way. And indeed there is. And the Buddha is saying, the right way to establish mindfulness is first becoming aware of your body, being embodied, becoming aware of the breathing is usually the first step of bodily awareness. And then there are various exercises for analyzing the body, analyzing the body in terms of elements, body parts, it goes on and on. But the first step of mindfulness is coming into an awareness of being an embodied, being bodied. The second is being then moving one's attention, one's awareness, one's focus to sensations, sensations of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and even the brain, and noticing these sensations arise. And in particular, 
noticing if you have a negative, positive, or neutral reaction to whatever it is. And the practice is noticing, oh, my stomach is empty, growling, and hungry, and I don't like it. That's a negative reaction to the sensation of my stomach. So that's the second foundation of mindfulness. The third foundation of mindfulness are mind states, chitta. But the way this works is understanding that those sensations that are, we are having a negative or positive reaction to, all of those successive negatives and positive reactions are causing our mind states, our chitta. And so there is a direct relationship between the body, sensations of the body, and then the mind state one finds oneself in. And so if one, one wants to understand one's mind state, it is suggested that you first become aware of your body so that you can become very aware of the reactions you're having to sensations of the body so that you can be aware of the mind states that such reactions are producing. That would then lead to the fourth foundation of mindfulness, which are dharmas, these truths of Buddhism, things like the Four Noble Truths, the relationship between attachment and suffering. And so one would then be able to understand their mind state as having arisen dharmically based on reactions to the body, the body. So everybody follow me on that? That's what the Buddha says is right mindfulness. I think that's a pretty straightforward definition of right mindfulness. And by the way, of course, wrong mindfulness would be like, I don't know, taking a drug that might put one in a trance state. You could do it that way too. You could do a bunch of things actually to get into a jhana or a, a jhanic state, but this is the right way to do it. Bodily awareness, sensorial awareness, mind state awareness, dharmic awareness. Okay, so then, but what is right samadhi? This is what we've been waiting all night for, right? And what is right samadhi? Here, one finds, wait, sorry. Here, one, secluded from kama, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, greedy states of mind, angry states of mind, deluded states of mind. So there, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a practitioner enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thought and examination, is with rapture and happiness that is born of seclusion. With the subsiding of thought and the subsiding of examination, one enters and dwells in the second jhana, which has internal confidence, a unification of mind, is without thought, is without examination, and has rapture and happiness born of samadhi, born of concentration. With the fading away of rapture, one dwells equanimous and mindful and clearly comprehending. They experience happiness with the body and they enter and dwell in the third jhana of which the noble ones declare. One is equanimous and mindful one who dwells happily in the third jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain 
And with the previous passing away of joy and displeasure, one enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasurable nor painful, and includes the purification of mindfulness by equanimity. This is called right samadhi. So I was a little surprised when I read that <laughs> because it kind of goes against the official teaching that samadhis are samadhis. But this says right samadhi is doing jhana practice. Can't front on the Buddha, right? By the way, our foremost expert in the Pranyaparamita literature, Edward Konza, he has an interesting chapter on samadhi. And he says, yeah, there's two. <laughs> he basically, in, his, in his, all of his uh, illustrious wisdom, says they seem to use samadhi two different ways. Yes, it means concentration. But in one hand, they, they kind of just mean meditation. Focus, you know. But then Ed, Edward Konza says, but then there is also like samadhi, like the deep, the real union, which is one way of, of defining samadhi. So when I read the Edward Konza book, I was sort of like, okay. It's not just me because <laughs> I, I was really was like starting to wonder, like, have I been giving everybody the wrong information for the last 10 years? And I was like, no, no, it's just that's one way of talking about it. That's one system. This, again, is an earlier system that seems to say this is the practice for jhanas equals samadhi. OK, so. We're obviously going to do a third night on Samadhi because I haven't gotten anywhere near these yet, but that's okay. So now let's talk about Samadhi. So uh, but actually, before I do it, is everybody okay with Diana? I feel like you got to hold on what, yeah, Tanya. Well, I just think about like in the ways that I've heard you t t teach the dhyanas and the samadhis before, and, and I realize this is different. You're bringing in a lot of stuff, but, um, you know, you've often, if I remember correctly, like the dhyanas are like the form, the, in the form of uh, form. And then once you get in the samadhi, it's the formless realms. So is this, yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I'm sorry if I'm throwing a, like a, you know, no, not at all. Um, so yeah, um, so the one thing I think that we can say with a certain degree of certainty, and, and by the way, again, Connie, awesome question to have asked so early on. I think that it's, we can say with certainty that whether it is a dhyana or a samadhi, both of those, uh, how can I put this? Both of those are free from kama, meaning they are both seemingly a state of mind that is not dependent upon and, and clingy to uh, external stimuli. So they are both speaking about a, a high degree of tranquility and contentment. And that word contentment is key. It's what I, it's kind of what I was getting at. I probably even said it when I was answering, answering Connie's question. This is about the ability to be totally happy. <laughs> It's about the ability to make yourself totally happy and not need anything to do it, to actually be able to generate your own pretty, the, what they call rapture, the bliss, the sukha, the joy, the ananda, all of these things. The idea is, is that 
there is this contentment. And the opposite of that is not being content because I need this or I need that. So again, when one is sort of, you know, I, I say this a lot too, and I, I think it holds for this. I normally say this about Diana, which is for me, the, the litmus test for Diana or Diana is that when the little bell goes off, you don't want it, you don't want it to end. Versus when the little bell goes off and you're like, oh, um, God, I was really waiting for that. If you couldn't wait for the bell to go, then you were not in a Diana. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, but it's like clearly. Whereas if you are sitting there and the bell goes off and you are just like, I'm going to do another five or 10 minutes because this is just, at, from my estimation, that's a Diana because we're dealing with that contentment here. I don't need to go do anything. In fact, what it, what it actually is, you almost realize, oh, if I start getting involved in something, it's going to ruin this. I've got this really nice frame of mind going on. And I just know if I open up my email, it's going to be destroyed. So Diana is about that peaceful state of mind and, you know, it's interesting what the sutra had to say about that the first stage is full of rapture and a mind examining, but that that discursive mind and that examination subsides, subsides. And in this example, it actually subsided even in the second jhana. And so the fourth jhana is always described as a state beyond pleasure and pain. It's part of what makes it equanimous in that sense. And that's a little like, that's a little tricky to talk about, a state beyond pleasure and pain. But I think it's worthy of reflection in terms of like, what would that even be in a sense? Because again, the idea is, and I've been doing it um, sort of upayakly all night, but the idea is, is like, we're trying to entice you into meditation by saying how wonderfully rapturous and pleasant it's going to be. And indeed it is. But what's interesting about it is, is that even though those first stages of, of, of dhyana are blissful and rapturous, that actually subsides. And that fourth dhyana is a state of neither pleasure nor pain, equanimity in that way. Samadhi though, so this word samadhi, it, it, so the word is sama and da, the root dar, samadhar, and samadhi or samada, it means to hold together, samadhi. There is a, definitely a connotation of oneness. All definitions of samadhi very much speak of oneness, either single pointed awareness, um, uh, one pointed awareness. Uh, I mentioned that union is a definition of samadhi. This is where it gets a little tricky because it's like, whoa, like which sutra are we going to use? We haven't even gotten to these samadhis and what that could mean. But let me, I'm trying to gauge how to. Can I, can I add something? Yeah, that would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I was also thinking that, uh, you know, like looking at the diagram that you've made, like samadhi is kind of like the, it's kind of like setting the base camp, right? In terms of like what you mentioned about uh, unifying or or coming together or or a union, so in a sense it's like um, it's like and with Diana it's almost like as with discursive thinking gone, with rapture gone, with even equanimity also above equanimity it's like okay now let's see now let's see 
like let's see what is mm. right so that was what i felt like especially with the diagram too i think it's almost like now we're ready to see and then yeah it's excellent ramit and excellent because that ties in that one thing i said at the beginning which is that samadhi in some some of these sutras i got here samadhi is a place where vipassana and shamatha start to there's actually even a definition of samadhi that it is the union of shamatha and vipassana now that's not the definition i'm just saying i have seen that definition of samadhi as union of uh, shamatha and vipassana i think you're right though ramit that it is though that it's in samadhi that the clear seeing sort of happens. Whereas in Dhyana, we're sort of, uh, my feeling too, and this is very personal, like both practice personal, but also like the way I understand Buddhism, a lot of the Dhyana Sati mindfulness stuff, it's really working on the heart, on like emotions greed and anger, bitterness, jealousy, resentment, like all of this emotional stuff that gets us all worked up. And so by doing the sati or the mindfulness and kind of bringing that all, it's shamatha, it's bringing it all down. And so for me, like when I think, when I think I'm in a dhyana or when I read about dhyana, it all strikes me as very emotionally chill. And indeed, the idea is, is that you cannot have this clear seeing if you're all worked up. So I think you're right, Ramit, that there is a way that this samadhi aspect is, it is where a certain aspect of the mind is re-engaged in a sense. And now there's some, I don't want to call it analysis because that would mean that we were searching. This is, we, we've done the analysis in some way and now we can just see it. We don't need to yeah. think about it. Yeah, can I, can I also yeah. like tie that into what Connie said earlier? Cause I kept thinking over and over and, and just with the conversation and how it went, it, it just kept getting further and further uh, obvious to me, but it was like planting the seeds of fulfillment, right? And so like planting, like the, the four noble truths, right? The fourth one being, uh, uh, or, well, I don't want to get it wrong, but the, cessation of suffering by removing the seeds of right and then so so by having uh samadhi or jhanas or enough distilling of the mind to then be able to find the causes of suffering and then you know f planting the the right seeds almost or removing the ones that are not mm -hmm. uh, not in line with how <clears throat> not in line with the dharma yeah yeah mm -hmm. Michael, I have a question for you, and it ties to um, a little bit, maybe it's a linguistic question. We always talk about linguistic here in, in our sessions as well. So when, um, you know, what you shared with us around Samadhi and Dhyana, um, but also from what I learned and from my own, ex learned and from my own experiences, it has this connotation when we talk about Samadhi, about um, attaining Samadhi, achieving Samadhi, work on samadhi which kind of makes sense but what comes into my like sensation or perception and beingness is like well wait a minute it's the opposite it's not working on it's not concentrating it's actually like being in what is experienced without effort so can you talk a little bit about effortlessness versus effort in, in that context? Yep. Um, I'm with you 100%, Connie. I think your understanding of it is totally right. There is the language of attainment, but it really isn't an effortful attainment. Even, even in the, the, you know, the Buddhist tradition, it's more, it is what you're describing. Meaning that like as one relaxes, shamatha, shamatha, mindfulness, mindfulness, jhana, jhana, as one keeps relaxing, keeps not doing, keeps shamathaing out, 
if they keep doing that, these things happen. And, and that's another thing to Kumara Jiva's uh, Sutra on sitting meditation concentration. He keeps talking about these things happening. And I know I've heard about these things happening. And so those things that happen, either the things that one sees or the ones things that one feels, they're considered attainments. But they're sort of these uh, symptoms of being in a samadhi. And the idea is, is that you could, you, would, you could know you were in the samadhi because you had the symptom. And so that's why the Buddhist tradition is always so big about attainments. They're like, oh, what, what samadhi did you attain in that way? And I mean, again, Connie, your thinking is very right on. And I just don't want you to think that it is thought of as effortful and that the attainment is something like a prize at the end. It's kind of not like that. And I want to actually, I'll give you an, a nice samadhi to end with that I think might tie a lot of this together in an interesting way. It's definitely a beautiful segue to next week when we will talk about these samadhis. <clears throat> so there's a lot of different samadhis that get spoken about. And then even within, of course, the Buddhist tradition, they start to get these like wild names, like the, you know, torch of wisdom and the, all of that, right? There is a samadhi, <clears throat> and I was trying to find its Sanskrit name, because I'd love to be able to give you the Sanskrit name for this, um, but I couldn't find it. I could only find the, the Chinese name for it. But this samadhi is considered the samadhi that the Buddha was in when he gained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. And it is a, a meditative state, a concentration, a samadhi, that the Buddha was supposedly in for three weeks, for 21 days. The samadhi is called the ocean-like samadhi. And the reason why, as far as I understand it, the reason why it's called the ocean-like samadhi is because the Buddha in his enlightened state supposedly looked out over the 3,000 great thousand world system. And the samadhi was where all phenomena were seen as waves on the surface of an ocean. So the samadhi was a, uh, to, to Ramit's comment, the samadhi was a clear way of seeing this world, fully dharmic, fully vipassionic, fully insightful. But we can understand it as a samadhi in terms of a state of unity or oneness, because all phenomena was being seen as one. But each, again, each thing is a little wave on the surface of the ocean. Oop, here it goes back into the ocean. And so to see all of reality, including the self, as just a wave on the surface of a oneness. That is considered a samadhi. It's considered focused, calm, it's considered jhanic, and it's considered samadhic <laughs> in that way that it is this peaceful trance-like state, but there is perception going on. There is there you, you one is observing reality, but not through the through the eyes of a fool in that sense. So that is sort of the idea of samadhis that it is um, a an attainment, a way of clearly seeing that seeing this world properly, truly and correctly in that way. So it is that ocean-like samadhi. It's that kind of samadhi that all 10 of these are, and we're going to talk about all 10 of these next week in detail, now that we have a clearer idea of what samadhi is. Everybody feeling good? All right, well, that's it for this installment of the Bodhisattva Shayamati Sutra. 
Um, thanks for being here, everybody. Great to see you.